for joining us. I have, my name is Isabel Rivera Collazo, for those of you that, that um, don't know me. Um, uh, it is my absolute honor and pleasure to be able to welcome John Foster today as our speaker in this colloquium of the Scripps Center for Marine Bio <laughs> Scripps Center for Marine Archaeology. Um, uh, John has degrees from UC Santa Barbara, UCLA, University of Arizona. He is a very successful archaeologist, retired from the California State Parks, where he was in charge of man managing heritage uh, programs in archaeology and history for uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation. Between 1983 to 2005, John was senior state archaeologist at uh, Parks and Rec, where he uh, worked to establish standards and policies for, um, for the, how to conduct archaeology and history within the department. And he also worked to recommend legislation and uh, policy implementation for the protection of, uh, of archaeology and underwater archaeology in particular in California. John's work has been very significant transforming the landscape of how underwater archaeology is practiced here. He was also California State Underwater Archaeology and is still a member of the State Parks Diving Safety Board that, that he still occupies to this day. Uh, John has had a very prolific and long career um, as lecturer, archaeology and researcher uh, starting in the 1960s and has received many awards for his work, um, including, for example, the National Geographic Explorer uh, Club Grant. His work has impacted not only California, but also Baja California and well beyond. In the 1990s, he worked in one of the only projects uh, on underwater archaeology in an indigenous context in the Caribbean, um, in a cenote or sinkhole in the Dominican Republic. His presentation today is titled Touching the Taino Coa Bay on the water archaeology at the Manantial de la Leta in the Dominican Republic. John, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, it's my honor to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for, to uh, Lauren for helping me set this up and everything. And you've kind of dragged me out of uh, retirement here, but I'm, I'm very happy to do that. And I'm delighted to be able to talk to you all today about a project that we did 25 years ago. But I think it's still relevant in many ways for today. So I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right into it here. Um, I want to, uh, let's see, here we go. Okay. Um, uh, you've summarized my career better than I was going to. I'm a generalist by nature. That's my, that my, my orientation in archeology span is I'm just basically interested in everything. And that can be kind of a curse sometimes, but I'm an average flint napper. I'm interested in rock art. I've done a lot of work in a lot of different sites, heritage sites all over California and elsewhere. And it's just been my pleasure to uh, find my spot in California State Parks. This was my dream job. It was my perfect job. I got a chance to interact with heritage sites all up and down the state. And unfortunately for me, I was one of the few people that actually had formal training in cultural resource management. So when it came to selecting somebody who was going to prepare the budgets and going to make the arguments for funding for this and funding for that and acquiring this site and not that site, that job fell to me. So I became, Fritz Riddell was the state archeologist. I was his assistant. And, um, and I spent a lot of my time in the office uh, doing the administration work, which, which got everybody else the money to do archeology. span Well, I occasionally would get out, sneak out of the office and get involved in projects here and there. Um, but I complained to my boss that um, you know, I really wanted to have more field work too, because I was really interested in doing field work. I was happy to do the administrative stuff, but I, but I wanted to get, find a specialty that I could contribute. And so he says, okay, Foster, if you can find something, a specialty that we need and that we don't have, I will free up time to make sure that you can do that. And boy, did I hit that one out of the park. I mean, 
underwater archaeology kind of landed on my plate. I loved it. I was interested from the get-go. I went down to Scripps and went through their dive program, became an advanced diver, and, and, and added to my skills as time went on. And I really took on the role of being the de facto California State underwater archaeologist. There wasn't anyone else. So it was all up to me to do that job. And I loved it. I threw everything I had into it. I, I worked up and down the state. I worked on gold rush ships. I worked on submerged cultural landscapes in Emerald Bay. I got assigned by the state of California to go to Baja, California and work with Ina there on a Manila galleon shipwreck. So it was a really, really exciting component of my career. And I'm very great, grateful to have uh, been selected to do that work. I joined up with some uh, other members of uh, the as a planning group uh, to push the park concept offshore. So we took out leases from state lands on areas that we felt were significant park uh, values underwater and included in that were some shipwreck sites, a submerged cultural landscape in Emerald Bay, and even some Ajumawe stone fish traps way up in Northeastern California. So um, I was very happy to do that work. I think it added a lot to my background and also contributed a lot to the state program. And then in 1993, I got a call from Indiana University, which really changed my career. And it was Charlie Beaker on the line. And he asked me if I would be interested in getting involved in an expedition to search for a Columbus shipwreck at Bahia Isabella on the north coast of the Dominican Republic up here. And uh, of course, I jumped at that opportunity. And it really started something which was, uh, I didn't know it was going to be, uh, it was going to last 20 years. But I'm so happy it did because we we got to do this and a whole lot of other things. Now, if you look at the bottom picture here, it was around this point uh, in January, January 4th, 1494, that Columbus arrived in the New World with the greatest fleet he ever brought here, a fleet of 17 ships and 1,200 colonists. And this is a place called Bahia Isabella. The town he founded here was La Isabella, the first Spanish colony in the New World. And then within the next couple of years, two hurricanes struck this bay and sank between six and nine ships out here. So our expedition was initially um, targeting uh, the discovery of one of those alien vessels. And you can see down here on the bottom, these are some of our charted magnetic uh, anomalies out there in Bahia Isabella. Well, those ships have eluded us, um, but the inspiration that they provided has carried us on now for over 20 years in studying this interaction between the Spanish and the people that, that uh, greeted those aliens on the shore of this wonderful island. Um, we started off looking uh, for the alien vessels of this character. And over time, um, we kind of switched the focus to a more general one, looking at a greater um, inventory of heritage sites across the Dominican Republic. We looked and found Captain Kidd's ship. We looked uh, at uh, some of the Columbus sites. But we decided that um, we needed to find a focus to find a research area in the Dominican Republic that we could make a contribution. This was seeing this object here is what changed my whole focus on our research. This is an anchor from the Santa Maria um, lost on the Columbus's first voyage. It's exhibited at the Farwa Cologne Museum in Santa Domingo. 
It was displayed at the Columbian Exposition and World's Fair in Chicago in 1893, the height of Columbus's popularity in the world. And it's a very, very important and unique object. Popular, popular talk uh, says that this anchor was presented to the cacique there uh, in that region after the Santa Maria was wrecked and that this was a venerated object kept by um, the uh, local Taino people and uh, in honor of Columbus's arrival. Well, when I saw this in the museum, I wondered about it because you can see here, this is our, this is our little sketch up here, but you can see that um, the arms of this anchor would have extended further. They're both broken and the palms, the thin metal plates here are also missing. And when I examined this anchor closely, I could see the hammering marks around the edge where the break was here and here. And it was clear that somebody hammered on this arm of this iron anchor until they softened the iron enough to break off that piece. And the same with the other arm. Now, in, in uh, underwater archaeology, you find occasionally you find broken anchors, but you never find one with both arms broken. One arm can get broken, but then the anchor's no, no good. So you don't find an example of an anchor with both arms broken. This anchor was not a venerated object given to um, people and held in some kind of esteem because of that. This was a, this was a sample of alien metal, which the Indians realized they could harvest and make into tools and perhaps even weapons. And so from that, from that realization, I kind of um, focused on my attention on the people that greeted Columbus on the shores of this new to them world. Well, this was a very, very interesting thing. And it was, it was my fortune to be engaged in this and in working with Indiana University. A little bit about the geography here, Puerto Rico, Hispaniola, which is two thirds Dominican Republic, one third Haiti, Cuba and Jamaica here make up the greater Antilles and the lesser Antilles are the stepping stone islands out in this direction here. So the books will tell you, and this, this is generally accurate, uh, that the peopling of this area began about 6,000, maybe 6,500 years ago across the Yucatan Channel here when archaic people made that crossing into Cuba and down through here into Hispaniola. Um, and, and subsequent migrations, there have been at least three of them uh, are here and they brought settled villages and agriculture, pottery, and, and uh, there was one underway at the time of Columbus's arrival. But the problem with this model of the peopling of the Caribbean is that it tends to imply that people replaced the earlier culture. And we know from the archeology span that that just isn't the way it happened. Uh, in fact, the archeology span shows that um, the peoples who occupied the greater Antilles at the time of Columbus's arrival were not one people, but they were a mixture, a wide variety of languages, cultures, and traditions uh, living on the same landscape. We call these people today the Taino, but that's, a, that's not really a, a term related to one group. It's more of a composite uh, shortcut term uh, for a very diverse set of people who arrived uh, in the greater Antilles uh, from 6,500 years ago um, to the relatively recent past. So that's where we are with that. 
So in trying to find out more about the people that greeted Columbus, we were astonished to learn that one of the people that came down the gangplank there at Isabella, along with the microbes and the guns, germs, and steel, was a man named Ramon Panay. Now, Ramon Panay was a Catalan monk uh, who came to Española with Columbus on his second voyage to the Indies. And he was assigned by Columbus to learn the language of the Taino people and to document their customs so they could be converted to Christianity. He spent four years traveling and studying the Taino cultures on Española. We don't know exactly where he went, but we know he stayed on the island of Española the whole time. And at the end of that period, four years later, he, he presented Columbus of an account of the antiquities of the Indies, a manuscript um, which, which was presented about 1498. And this, is, this account is considered the first true ethnographic documentation of any New World people. It provides a record of the Taino language and cultural elements, and it's mostly non-judgmental and documents the Taino beliefs, religion, society, and customs. And refreshingly, uh, Panay admitted to not completely understanding what he was told. Now, how could he possibly completely understand what he was told? But at least he admitted that. Uh, in any event, uh, centuries later, ethnographers studying the Arawakan speaking peoples of the Orinoco River Basin documented many of the cultural traits noted by Panay for the Taino. So there's every reason to believe that he accurately recorded much of what he was told about the Taino. And remember, this was, this was documented at the time before the Taino were much affected by the arrival of the Spanish. So unlike most uh, ethnographers that come later, uh, this occurred at the height of the Taino culture before things started to change very seriously. So in looking around at what Indiana could do to, um, to contribute to a better understanding of the, of the past and the history of, uh, of Dominican Republic, we, we visited a number of excavations. They were all very interesting. They convinced us that we should not do any excavations ourselves. There were already a lot of unprocessed collections in the Museum of the Dominican Man. Here you can see a beautiful excavation and a circular house that's outlined with these post holes here. So there were lots of, uh, lots of things we looked at. We were looking at the maritime setting, the adapt adaptation to a maritime culture made by the Taino people. This is an extraordinary thing. And the fact that their, their canoes, their trading vessels, their canoes ranged over great distances throughout the Caribbean basin there. And uh, Columbus uh, noted that the Taino had names for over 500 islands in the Caribbean. So this was very, very, very interesting. But we decided that we would pursue uh, a research into the Taino spiritual landscape. And we decided we would do that by looking at caves, sinkholes, and rock art sites in the Eastern Dominican Republic. And we did that and we found all kinds of great sites. We were taken to a number of different sites and our focus turned out to be, see this green area here? This is the low limestone terrace which occupies about a third of the country of the Dominican Republic. And it's almost completely without, it's, it's a limestone um, formation, which has many, many collapses, which produces caves and sinkholes and rock art sites uh, throughout this area. So it was a perfect way for us to make a contribution. These are some of the sites that we, we looked at, there are more. But uh, we had our hands full looking at uh, a Taino spiritual landscape with Ramon Panay uh, being more or less our ambassador to that time 
and those sets of beliefs. Our focus was in the Igwe uh, Casicasco, which is uh, one of the five uh, chiefdoms on the island of Hispaniola in 1492. And so this was the area of our focus of our research. And the karst, karst topography there, the collapsed limestone formation provided the Taino access to a dark zone underworld, which uh, set the stage for uh, our study and a very, very interesting. So I'm gonna show you a few examples of this. Here's the entrance to Cueva Panchito. Um, as other researchers had previously noted, you find petroglyphs at the mouth of the caves and then painted rock art on the interior. And here at the mouth of this cave at Cueva Panchito, we have this boundary, this spiritual boundary between the living and the spirit worlds, which is very, very uh, unique and important. Not only that, but when we looked at the rock art itself, we recognized something that Panay had written. He wrote about uh, a character named Mako Kael in the Cave of the Hagua story. Mako Kael, he of the eyes that do not blink. He was the guardian of a sacred cave and he was turned to stone when he returned late to his post as the guardian. This is recorded by Panay in 1498. Well, look at this image, eyes that do not blink. You rarely find this in rock art. Eyes are common, of course, they're just circles. You don't see the pupils in rock art eyes very often. Here, not only do you have eyes that do not blink, you have eyes in the palms, you have animal ears and people ears, and you have fro a frog body and frog legs and a very prominent umbligo or navel. Now his characters surrounding him don't have these same features. So there's something very, very significant here about this thing. And we think it relates to the Mako Kael story. And that got us started uh, in looking at rock art as, as perhaps uh, Ramon Panay looked at it and was told about it. Um, you know, over 500 years ago. Here's another example, a carved speleothem at the entrance to Chicho Cave, another boundary marker between the lighted world and the dark underworld. And here the petroglyphs mark, the, mark that boundary and beyond, and this is a flooded cavern, I found at a depth of 28 feet, this beautiful potisa, a ceramic bottle thought to be associated with the elites of Taino society. So this is, uh, this is an example, but the best example we had was uh, at a cave called the Jose Maria Cave. And again, we're in the Parque Nacional de Cotabanama. Um, it's about three miles from the coast. It's a beautiful, beautiful rock art cave and something very, very special. Again, petroglyphs mark the exterior, the world of shadow, the world of sunlight, and then you enter the world of darkness and find painted imagery. Uh, individual images at the beginning and larger and singular images as you go deeper in. This is curious. In, in the Jose Maria cave, we noticed that the um, that the postures of these anthropomorphic forms were very curious, you know, and they were all practically all the same. And we wondered about that. So one day when we were down there with a group of students, we all turned out all of our headlights, flashlights and everything else. And we took one lantern and waved it around to simulate torchlight. And these figures came to life. They danced on the walls. And we knew something, we knew, we recognized that there was something going on here beyond just rock art as we usually think of it. This was something else. This was something special. It was something sacred. They painted the walls, painted bats, wings, and other designs on the walls themselves. And as you go deeper into the cave, there are 1,200 individual images that have been recorded by our colleague, 
Adolfo Lopez in this cave. It's a fantastically complex uh, collection of, of various images. Even deeper, uh, the images are larger and in some cases almost grotesque. Um, and you get to uh, these panels, which are really complicated. And normally, as a rock art researcher, I hesitate to apply meaning to rock art because we're so far removed from that. It's only a guess and it's probably wrong and everything else. But here we have a guidebook presented by Ramon Panay, uh, collected from the living people who were creating and using these places at the time of their arrival. So in this case, we have something else we can consider. Now, Panay notes that, uh, for example, that the sun and the moon emerged every day from a cave. Well, look at this. Here's, here's the sun perhaps emerging from a cave. And that the people of IT or Kiskaya, this served as a place maybe uh, for the teaching of these stories, of this history uh, to initiates. And that's what uh, one of the rock art specialists has, has proposed. And I think that's a possibility. We may never know for sure. Even deeper into the cave, you come to a large speleothem with this very, very curious figure, this very, very curious face. Now the Taino had no beards. This is clearly a bearded uh, face. And we know again from Ramon Panay that something very, very special occurred in this area of Igwe. We know this from actually Bartolome de las Casas recorded a treaty signed in 1503 between uh, a man named, uh, a captain named Juan de Esquivel from the Spanish uh, with the cacique Cotuquanama of the Igwe uh, Cacicasco. Uh, and it was an agreement that Spanish were in terrible trouble in 1503. They'd relocated their, their capital to Santo Domingo. The crops had failed and they were starving. They needed, they needed food. And the Taino agreed to provide them food in exchange for being left alone. This was recorded by Las Casas and documented. The date was 1503, okay? So here's the last panel in the Jose Maria cave, the deepest panel um, painted in the cave itself. And it's basically an agricultural scene. Um, and um, um, this is my little sketch of it here, but, uh, uh, this is the cassava, cassava plant or the guayga plant. It was more common guayga in this area of the island. A guayo, a grater to process it um, and baking the breads. This is one of the breads under the direction of a cacique, never mind the spaceship, and delivered to the Spanish by way of a caravel. So we don't know if this is right, but if it is correct, that this treaty was memorialized by the Taino of the Igwe district and, and protected as one of their uh, cultural, important cultural events, uh, then that would mean that this is probably the first depiction of a Spanish vessel in the new world. Now I've gotta be honest with you and tell you that uh, our radiocarbon dates have not confirmed this and they're all over the board. So uh, there's something wrong with our radiocarbon work on the rock art uh, pigments here. But nonetheless, well, you can see um, that there is the potential for uh, getting greater understanding by use of some of Ramon Panay's recorded observations. And when you look at uh, a spiritual landscape today. So that brings us to the main feature of our program today, a site called Manantial de la Aleta. Now this is a, uh, a sinkhole, a water site, a spring. The term Aleta refers to um, 
the beekeeper's house that was there when we first arrived. And it had a high roof on it and people thought that it resembled the fin of a fish. So manantial de la leta return, refers to the leta is fin. It's again in the middle of Cotubanama National Park. This is taken from a helicopter. And um, you can see again, this vast limestone terrace that constitutes much of the uh, eastern part of the Dominican Republic and particularly this national park here. Um, it's, it's, I want to point out one thing here that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, this is a dry tropical forest. There's very little surface water here. The water that does uh, fall in terms of rainfall uh, uh, collects in, in pockets in the limestone and the roots of these trees grow into those pockets. So when hurricanes sweep through here, which they do about every seven years or so, and knock down a lot of the, of the uh, trees, they don't die. They fall over and then they re-sprout. And you, the consequence of this is you have this real tangle of forest growth, which makes it very, very difficult uh, to penetrate. And the Spaniards described this themselves saying that the forest was so thick, even a cat couldn't get through. So on we go. Uh, this is La Leta. This was the uh, presidential helicopter that was assigned to us in 1996. Um, this is probably, and I think certainly, the most important ceremonial site in Hesp Hispaniola. It, um, it features at least four ceremonial plazas. Sorry, got a little interference there. Um, and here's where we landed the helicopter. So these ceremonial plazas are very important. Uh, Isabel knows this and recognizes this kind of thing. But um, for those of you that may not know, uh, these were areas that were cleared on the limestone. They were smoothed out and they were the places for gatherings of people. So this, this site, La Aleta, was a political and ceremonial center for sure for Higüe and maybe for much of Hispaniola itself. Uh, the, their force of the, these ceremonial plazas, some of, their, some of them are lined with upright stones. And it's here where the Antillan uh, version of the Mesoamerican ball game was played. Um, this is uh, comparable to the to the great ceremonial site La Caguana in Puerto Rico, and where some 13 rectangular and circular plazas have been documented. Uh, the Antillan version of the ball game played here, unlike the Mayan version where the ball, a rubber ball was propelled through a goal of some kind, a ring of some kind. Apparently the, the, the Antillan version of this was to keep the ball in the air, not to propel it through a goal. Um, but anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a form of the, of the Mesoamerican ball game that was exported to the Caribbean, uh, just like it was exported to the Southwestern United States. So, so uh, amazing kind of thing there. But the Aleta is uh, unique for this aspect right here. This is a six by nine foot opening in the limestone revealing an underground lake. And this is really a dramatic site. It's, uh, it's unique in, in, in the Dominican Republic as far as we know, there could be others, but uh, so far uh, nothing has been found to resemble this exactly. It's a rappel of 50 feet to get to the water of Montiel de la Leta, and that uh, requires you rappelling down here uh, on a rope. Um, we didn't know anything about climbing when we started this, and we learned a lot. Uh, it was still scary for me, I got to tell you, uh, climbing and, and trying to uh, lift yourself up out of this uh, hole. But um, it's a very, very unique site. I've I've 
I've drawn a little um, diagram of the profile here. Um, it's a 50 foot rappel down to the water level, crystal clear water, another 35 feet to uh, this sulfur chemocline, which is, um, which is the uh, accumulation of uh, the material from a bacterium that lives in this water. And it has a specific gravity, so it bands up and it floats in the water column. And in this case, it uh, starts at a level of uh, 35, at a depth of 35 feet and goes to 50 feet. And it's 15 feet thick. It's so opaque and so strong that you can't read your, your gauges in front of your mask. So it's that, it's that strong, it's that opaque. And we tested this. We put a boat down here. We released a shiny object as an offering and it comes down a direct sun directly overhead. It comes down and then disappears through this sulfur chemocline into the vastness beyond. And you could see this from the surface. You could see this from the top. This is a clear boundary to an underworld. So uh, continuing our profile, um, there's uh, 50 feet down to a depth of 119 feet, crystal clear water. This is an aphotic boundary. So no, very little light penetration through this uh, to the darkness below where you find an an anoxic sediment uh, with artifacts at the bottom. So that's what it is. Um, here's what the limnologist uh, came back with with testing. The temperature is constant from top to bottom. It's about 75 degrees for the divers. Uh, and the pH is also constant from top to bottom. But look at the, look at the dissolved oxygen here. When you get to a depth of 10 meters, the dissolved oxygen goes to zero. So this is a dead zone all the way down to the bottom. Nothing that breathes oxygen can live down here. Perfect preservation conditions. You just can't get any better than that. So here we are. Welcome to Kauai Bay. Uh, on the Cap Rock, a depth of 119 feet, the Taino underworld a spiritual landscape, and as Ramon Pane said, the home and dwelling place of the dead. Um, it gets your attention. <laughs> a dive here gets your attention. As you move away from the top of the cap rock, you begin to notice the accumulation of organic material all over the place. And some of it is artifactual, some of it is just detritus that's worked its way down the hole over the centuries perhaps, but immediately your eyes are drawn to things like these gourds with cordage tied. You can see the variety of gourds here. Some are cut and carved and shaped. Uh, some of them are more natural in their, in their shape and so on. But look at the preserved wood. Look at the, look at the other objects here. It's, it's just an amazing, amazing thing. I wrote my, in my field notes, this is a liquid archeological deposit. And by that, I mean that you could, you could take your arm and press down through this deposit all the way to the bedrock down below. Everything is floating in suspension. The lighter objects are on the top, the heavier ones, the pots and so on are, are below that. But uh, everything is moving and everything is preserved. It's just an extraordinary thing. Look at this one here. You've got basket, basket, gourd, 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 pot, shaped gourd, cut gourd up here, feathers. And look down here. If you look closely, you'll see a potisa, a potisa with, uh, with, um, with bindings on it, a potisa, like the one I found. Anyway, this is a depth of 150 feet. Um, much of this wood uh, will turn out to be shaped 
and carved. Um, there are just organic objects everywhere, feathers, gourds, pots uh, in every direction. The preserved wood is just amazing, astounding. Here we are at a depth of 165, a basket at 128, and again, uh, just an extraordinary deposit. Look at this one here, a beautiful pot next to a beautiful gourd with cordage and a feather, amazing. Some of this wood will turn out to be objects of, these are actually artifacts of various kinds, um, but very, very, very well preserved in this particular setting, amazing. A uh, gourd container with cordage, 165. And this was the deepest, I think the deepest artifact we photographed at a depth of 185 here. I only went to 150, so um, other people were able to go to 185. But it, it continues down, it continues down the slope. Yeah, so uh, there is certainly a vast, uh, a, a vast uh, collection of, of objects here that are, are, are unique, are unique. This basket, there is no basket, there are no Taino baskets in any museum in the world. So it gives you an, an example of the potential for this site uh, to inform us about the side of the Taino culture and spiritual beliefs that we don't otherwise have any chance of ever understanding. So that's why I think this site is so incredible. Here's some examples of a wooden bowl and a couple of pots that are about to make their way to the surface. Here we are back at the cap rock at a depth of 119 feet. Wooden bowls, we collected a number of these. The Taino were very famous for their woodworking and these are examples of these beautiful examples of these carved. Look at this, look at this bowl. This is a, a carved wooden bowl with a carved wooden liner. This is a thin shaped uh, piece of wood carved to fit inside this bowl. The use of it, I, I can't imagine what it was used for but it demonstrates a, a remarkable ability of woodworking. Um, many of the bowls are flared and uh, we, would, we would think of them as serving bowls. Uh, radiocarbon dates are here, we've got eight of those. This is something, oh, I've got to go back here. Uh, anyway, okay. This is a, this is a, um, an artifact called a makana. It's a war club, it's a Taino war club. It was described by Bartolome de las Casas as a spade of palm wood, which is extremely hard and very heavy with a flat handle. It is hard and heavy like iron. And although a man wears a helmet on his head, one blow will sink his skull into his brains. Uh, so this is a unique object. It's never been, there's not another one anywhere known in the world. Uh, so it's just a remarkable find from uh, Manantial de la Leta, including the ads marks here on the business end of it, which shaped it. So a remarkable thing. Uh, petaloid celts and the halves that held them, radiocarbon day here. So we've got that. Now here's another example of materials that were found together. We think this was an offering. These were offered together. This is a vomiting spatula, radiocarbon date, 1320, um, along with a cahoba, a wooden cahoba vessel. Now, Ramon Panay described to us the cahoba use in the Taino world. And this was a hallucinogenic snuff, which was inhaled. And you prepared yourself for that experience by purging and cleansing yourself with a vomiting spatula. Uh, the Maya also did this, by the way. And then inhaling the snuff, 
allowed you communication through Zemis to the spirit world. Here we found the kit, at least part of the kit, we think, at a depth of 127 feet. Another unique object, um, here's a complete duho, a little wooden stool and the discoverer, Harley McDonald, one of our students there, uh, radiocarbon date AD 1260. Uh, and again, we know the purpose of duhos, they were symbols of elite and prestige in Taino society. There are 118 of them known in collections around the world. And this is the smallest one. This is way too small for a person. It must have been, we think, uh, a duho for a zemi, the seat of a zemi itself. In any event, it was offered uh, at La Aleta. And here's one of the zemis. Zemis were very important. Uh, all the households had zemis. The elites had a variety of them through which they communicated with their ancestors. So pottery vessels, a wide variety of shapes and forms. Many of the bowls are navicular in shape, boat shaped. Um, those are common at La Aleta. This was one of our favorites. This became a, the symbol of our expedition, this frog pot as we call it. A proto chicoid style with late saladoid iconographic and decorative element, um, according to Adolfo Lopez. And we wondered uh, what the frog um, image uh, felt to see sunlight after maybe a thousand years of immersion in La Leta. Another Example of uh, pottery wow. here, and this one, this one is particularly important, I think, in understanding the purpose of La Aleta, because it, um, it's, it has a, it's a normal pot, it's a normal pot, but it has a big resin patch on it. In other words, this isn't an ornamental vessel. This is a working pot, and it was intended to be offered for use by ancestor spirits in an underworld. So this, this reinforces the observations uh, by Panay that, that the underworld was a real place where real spirit beings uh, were, were operating, were functioning. Uh, more pots, I'm gonna show you these very quickly. This is a very unique style. There's lots of different ones. We originally thought that perhaps the, the, um, the wide variety in pottery styles here meant that people were making long pilgrimages to this site. But now we know that this variety extended uh, reasonably close by so that uh, perhaps it was a regional ceremonial center. In any event, we can't say that these are all exotic because there was a wide variety of ceramics being produced in the Eastern part of Igwe uh, at the time of Columbus's arrival. Intact bowl with food remains, uh, West Indian fan palm is the, is the food here. Um, and here's an, here's an incised gourd, radiocarbon date of 1097 AD. This one we brought to the surface very carefully in an enclosed container. But um, the, just the little bit of jostling it received, it just collapsed on us. And, but you can see the, the precise design that was, that was etched into this. And um, we know, of course, from Ramon Panay again, that gourds themselves have a very uh, symbolic and spiritual meaning in Taino culture because the, uh, the attempt to steal some bones from a gourd container hung from the rafters of the house. Well, when it spilled and broke, uh, it released the fishes and became the sea in Taino, in the Taino creation story. So this is very important stuff. Um, our, our, um, this was not a snatch and grab type operation. We did the best we could to maintain and to record 
provenience of every object that we removed. Uh, we measured distance bearing and depth to anything that we recovered from a datum we applied on, we established on the cap rock. And our research was guided by um, government officials and Dominican scholars who were on the site and able to see what we were bringing up and advise us as to its meaning and, and it, as to its uh, condition. So we appreciate that very much. These are the, the two pilots of the helicopter there. So in summary, um, our expeditions to Manantial de la Aleta between 1995 and 1998 uh, consisted of 245 no decompression dives, the average bottom time being about 11 minutes, and therefore a total time in the underworld of about 45 person hours over the course of three, three and a half years. So that's not a lot of time. We did a selective recovery of 241 objects. We mainly left baskets and gourds in place because we didn't have the wherewithal to recover them safely. Uh, we, um, we have eight radiocarbon dates um, on objects um, recovered from the Aleta, and that spans a time frame of 1058 to 1392 um, AD. Uh, this is the first and best documented offertory site in the Taino culture area. It may not be the only one. We actually know of another one, but it's not nearly as deep and uh, it's been looted by divers already. But our, our estimation is that the range of recovered and observed artifacts at this site represents a comprehensive package of Taino material culture, weapons, food containers, cohoba ritual objects, symbols of authority and prestige. In other words, everything needed to keep a real spirit world in balance. And um, you can read more about this in the Journal of Caribbean Archaeology and our uh, chapter in a book uh, from 2017 called The Archaeology of Underwater Caves. Uh, for the divers out there, I just want to briefly say we, we made, these were all no decompression dives. We were diving in a very remote area. We were very far from any kind of medical attention. So we did use um, hospital oxygen um, to uh, breathe at for three minutes at 15 feet, just to make sure that our nitrogen levels were knocked down and we could operate safely within no decompression limits. And so that was very useful. So as we ascend back up through this sulfur layer um, and approach the living back on top, uh, we take stock of this and try to, try to think about what is the meaning of this site. And I think that La Aleta is clearly a portal connecting the three dimensions of the known Taino universe. That's the celestial vault, the earthly plane, and below the, the sulfur layer, uh, the watery underworld of Koya Bay. And it's to hear that the ritual objects were sent. Um, this was a gateway for the veneration of the spirits of the Taino ancestors, but it was not a one-way portal. We know from Ramon Panay that the Taino spirits would emerge at night through places like this, and either in the form of bats or in the form of human people, from the human form, and interact with people of the living world. And so you can imagine what kind of mischief that that might cause. So it was very important to maintain a balance and harmony in this spirit world that was accessible down here. And so that's what we think uh, the Aleta is significant for. 
So an expedition that started off looking for the alien vessels of this character uh, focused over time on a, reaching a better understanding of the people that greeted Columbus and whose culture was swept away on the shores of the Caribbean Sea. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the invitation. I want to recognize my co-principal investigators here, Charles Beaker uh, and Jeffrey Conrad, who we lost around Christmas time this last year. And I want to particularly point out um, our mentor, our friend, uh, Peter Morales Troncoso, who as the governor of East National Park facilitated us getting the permits and the connections to do this research here. And it was through him that made, he, he was the man that made this all possible. So thank you very much. I'm kind, I'm very happy to uh, entertain your easy questions if I can. Thank you very much. So much, John, it's awesome. Um, I have questions of my own, but I see that there were some questions in the chat and um, I wanted also to invite people if anybody would like to ask, you know, uh, raise your hand and ask um, anything else. Um, Lauren, I'm happy if you help me as well, moderating questions. Um, I'll start with one of the ones that is online uh, Moon, would you like to ask your question uh, live? Sure. Um, hi, Dr. Foster. Thank you so much for like a fast, this incredibly fascinating um, talk. And I actually had no idea what this talk was going to be about before, um, you know, I started it. And I'm really grateful that I attended because it has resonances with my own research a lot. Um, I think you actually pretty thoroughly answered the question that I did have, but I guess I wanted to pose it again um, in case you might have any other thoughts, but basically I want to ask how the karst landscape and spiritual landscape of um, Taino Koi Bay, Bay uh, might mutually constitute each other or reflect each other if you have any further thoughts on that, because I know you, you know, sort of went through that pretty thoroughly, um, because I also um, have my own research on karst landscapes in um, southern Thailand, so seeing these karst residences around the world really speaks to me and fascinates me. Well, um, yes, I, I, you know, all I can say about that is that um, we know from Panay that uh, these places were recognized and very important. They're part of the origin story. They're, they're, they're where the celestial objects sleep and that kind of thing. So it's very important. These objects then, I mean, these places, and they occur uh, very much in the, in the karst topography. So I think it's kind of a natural thing that's two go together where the karst topography uh, exists. I think humans are kind of naturally drawn to that and uh, that, uh, that um, becomes a spiritual landscape. It's a natural thing. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry, how, how do you, pronounce um, this underworld um, or paradise type Koyabe. area again. Koyabe. Could you be that? Koyabe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, before I go to the next question in the chat, is there anyone uh, here live that would like to pose an additional question? While people gather there, um, uh, I see that there is there are two questions in the chat, one from Jerry Correa and the other one from Caitlin um, regarding the layer of sulfur um, and the anoxic conditions. Basically, um, Jerry asks why there was a layer of sulfur and Caitlin also asked around, you know, why there was a layer of sulfur and if the anoxic conditions underneath it have to do with, you know, with the presence of that layer there. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, the sulfur is produced by the bacterium that live in this, in this water column. And it's their excretions that form 
this material that builds up over time and it, it has a specific gravity. So it bands up and it just floats there in the water column. And when, when the divers, when we're down there and we're blowing these huge giant bubbles through it, it disperses. But the next day, it's all banded up again. Oh. And so it's a very, very opaque, very strong sulfur tasting kind of thing. And it's something that, you know, is, a, is just one of these boundaries. And it's so opaque that there's no light down below. Just the, the faintest glow as you're, as you're sitting there on the cap rock and you look up, you see this very, very faint glow. But other than that, there is no, there's no light down there. So you only see what your lights are shining on. And um, the question about the um, anoxic uh, uh, conditions, um, that's, that's the result of, uh, uh, you know, of this, of this situation that's been there, static water for so long, and the oxygen just doesn't exist down there. I don't know the particulars, honestly. All I know is that there's no crawdads, there's no fish, there's nothing living down there. And it's a very, very extraordinary. Any place else you go diving, you see something alive, uh, but not here. So it's very, very remarkable. And that leads to the second, the third question. The, uh, Jerry also asks about how to get into the Scripps diving program, but we can address that later. But uh, following on what you were ex just explaining, John, um, Sheila Podell asks is if anyone has looked at the microbes in the um, water layers or the anoxic sediments on the cave. Um, we did. We did look at the fish on the upper, the upper part of the water column above the sulfur layer. Uh, there were some people from the um, from Santa Domingo that came out and collected some fish, little tiny fish like guppies, um, from there. But I don't think anybody has examined the bacterium at all. I don't know. I don't know for sure. But no, none of us have. So uh, that that's, remains to be done. Yeah. <laughs> I see that Eric has his hat up, his hand up. Eric. Why are you saying this to me? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, um, let's read that one. We got multiple yeah. computers in our lab. Um, but John, thank you so much for a really fascinating um, presentation and for talking about this site. I know a lot of us underwater archaeologists are just always fascinated every time we see organics and especially the baskets materials that survive. Um, my question though is more about the ball courts that you had mentioned at the site. And I was really happy to see Caguana being brought in here. Um, thinking about, I know Isabel and I have recently, we just recently put out a publication about the broader landscapes that surround the ball courts that might have additional um, either agricultural sediment features, settlement features. And so I was curious, um, knowing the landscape that's surround there, um, do you see that, is there being any research done on this broader landscape or, um, has, or is this something that might be done in the future? Oh, this is something that definitely needs to be done in the future. There's a couple of things that, that I would like to see happen. Uh, further research, not necessarily collecting artifacts, but photogrammetry down there, you can use little um, underwater drones now that could go, you don't need to take divers, although you want, you know, tech divers can go and take pictures that, that drones can't necessarily take. So there's probably a room for both. But in particular, on the surface, this is tailor-made for LIDAR studies. This vegetation is, you, you can't crawl through it. I mean, it's that thick. So for LIDAR, as has been discovered in the Maya area, you can, you can see features and patterns and trails and, and squares that are no longer visible from the surface. So I, I, I would love to see in the future um, a combination of LIDAR studies on the surface. I, I, the, the Jose Maria cave is only about less than three miles from the Aleta site. And there must have been a, a major corridor between those two. I just, I just think, you know, and and who knows what other features are out there? There could be all kinds of things exposed. Um, so, 
Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a very important future research. I hope it, I hope it happens. Thank you so much, John. <laughs> I love the parallels that, I mean, of course, there are relationships between the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, and uh, there are so many things that we have still to explore regarding this relationship with the landscape. I, well, if anyone, if some, anyone else has a question, um, feel free to raise your hand. I do wanna make one comment. I see there's a question regarding the recording of the slides. Uh, Lauren is working on that, so we are hoping to make the recordings available. Um, so, but I did, I did wanna ask, I was thinking of, you know, the symbology that you're seeing among these uh, vessels in, within the uh, La Aleta um, and the iconography from the cave. In Puerto Rico, we are seeing in some of these, you know, ritual spaces in this twilight of the entrance of the cave or the inside of the cave, we're seeing panels of, three to four characters, one main one, like the, um, we, who, which was the Makokael, was it the one that you had? Yeah. Uh, this uh, central character flanked by two or four additional smaller characters. And it's the same type of iconographic construction that you see in, um, in Caguana with the central Atabe with the other two or, or yeah. three ancestors flanking. Um, do you see also that pattern in um, in the um, what uh, Maria Jose in the cave of Maria Jose that you also have like the central Macaco and then other characters flanking it? There, there's very very little um, uh, of an entrance to the Jose Maria cave, so there's very few petroglyphs there, and they're not they're they're not really uh, there's no panels or right. no, figures or anything at that particular cave. But you know, one thing that's really interesting, I, I was going to mention this and I forgot about it. And I don't know what the situation is in Puerto Rico and maybe it's it's different. But, but you know, Pane makes a big um, deal about the, the spirit beings are, are perfect copies of the human form, except for one thing. They lack the umbligo. Oh. There's no navel. There's mm -hmm. no navel. So I think a navel is very important. It's a very important symbol because that's the difference between a spirit person and a real person, you know? And, and I there, are th there are things like that. And, uh, you know, I hate, I hate to keep going back to Ramon Panay, but honestly, he, he provided us such a, such a beautiful example of what to look for, what to recognize, what to, what to pick out, what, what its possible meaning is. And it, it's a very great predictor of, you know, some of this symbology that we see. So I, I just think we kind of lucked into this and, but the more we started looking at it and going back and rereading Panay, which you can download from the internet and you should, you should read it. It's, um, it's really, it's really interesting, you know. Anyone interested also, this book is called uh, El Caribe Precolombino, that is from Fray Ramón Pané. Um, it's in Spanish, but it also has some really good references and good images that explains many of the things that, that John is explaining. Um, one comment uh, regarding the ancestors, I, all, I was discussing with Jose Oliver as well, not just the navel is important, but also the shape of the eyes, if they are the coffee bean types or the open eyes as living or dead ancestors, human or non-human. So there's very cool, many cool things going on there. Uh, Mom, you have another question. Oh, I'm sorry. I, really quickly, um, besides Panay and this book you mentioned, um, Dr. Foster, uh, the Archaeology of Underwater Caves. Are there, are there any other resources you'd like to recommend um, for us to read um, for further information on this topic in particular? Well, um, Isabel can give you, uh, there, there's a lot written about this. And, um, and so, but, but many times um, some of the ideas don't really uh, connect with actual places on the ground. Our, our study was a little bit different because it was done by archeologists and we went and looked at these things. And uh, 
and we saw some of these patterns ourselves. So, um, but I think we're still at the kind of the beginning point of trying to understand this, you know, and, and um, there's a lot of good literature out there. Um, uh, this work I'm talking about was done 25 years ago. So uh, there's a lot that's happened since. There have been great improvements to radiocarbon dating of rock art pigments and that kind of thing. Um, and so I think, um, you know, you can expect to see improvements and, and new insights as, as that advances. Great. Thank you, Dr. Foster. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm not a doctor. You're not a doctor? Oh, oh uh, no, I have a master's degree. I'm not a doctor, but, uh, you know, I'm an archaeologist. So, okay. Anyway, um, thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. Thanks so much. Any further question? Tiana, do you have anything? Isabel. Hi. Um, hi, John. This is hi. great to see you. It's great to see Isabel. Uh, I just want to say thank you for the invite. This is a, an amazing sight. Uh, when when I when when we met down in the Dominican Republic, I, I remember you shared the the your publications and, and I was fascinated. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's just amazing. And I hope there's a lot more research done on this area, possibly on other areas around the Dominican Republic, because this is very unique. So thank you. Great to see you. Well, it's nice to see you too. And, and one last comment. I, I do think, um, and you know, from my park background, I'm always concerned about, you know, t telling the significance of a place without being able to protect it. And when we were working there 25 years ago, uh, its isolation kind of protected it. But nowadays you can't count on that and people are industrious and they get out there. I would really like to see uh, a great uh, designed and put over the entrance to the Aleta, which would allow the bats and the spirits to pass through, but not the looters who want to get in there and grab stuff. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, it presents some difficulties, but along with the uh, future research that I've kind of pointed to, I'm hoping that uh, both of those things will eventually get done. It's just a very, very important site. And I think it has, a, has much to tell us about the Taino culture and ancestry. For sure. I see that Paul had raised his hand. Oh, well, I don't want to overstay, but um, I love the talk. It was really fascinating. I came in a little late. Do you see any parallels to Maya cave archaeology in a, in a very large sort of Americanist sense, or is it much more of a specific tradition? And uh, second question, did Jeff Conrad die? I didn't know that about him. Yeah, yes, he did. He did. Fascinating. Um, yeah, pancreatic cancer. No, uh, no, dive, dive. Was he diving? Oh, no, 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 no. He was not a diver, but, yeah. um, you know, he, he was working on the, on, on the surface sites and, and features and stuff. And he was, our, he was our partner. He, he helped us understand things. Um, as, far as, um, as far as a connection with the Maya world, I, uh, there certainly is one by way of South America, probably. Uh, you know, and that's how the ball game gets out there and other features. We do occasionally in archaeological context find things that are definitely from South America. Gold, for example, gold uh, figurines and things like that will occasionally be found. But, and rightfully so, the, um, the Caribbeanists are very sensitive about considering the uh, the culture there to be a kind of a country cousin of the Maya, and they are not. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, but there were certain aspects of Maya, you know, there are 300 ball courts in Arizona and New Mexico that are the result of the playing of the Mesoamerican ball game and exporting that idea all the way to New Mexico and Arizona. So that's what I'm talking about, you know, with trade and with exchange come ideas which are 
converted to a Caribbean version of something, you know? So there's that connection for sure. And certainly these were two maritime peoples who had vessels out there trading all over the place. They must have encountered each other. You can imagine that must have happened. So yes, there was definitely some contact, but the, the Caribbean uh, version of this is not the same as the Maya version at all. You know. They have other similarities. There's a, there's a numerical system that's ba based on 20. There, there are many other things that are parallels, but uh, they are very unique. The, the Caribbean version is very unique. So, so the specifics of sinkhole sacrifice are quite different and enough to call a different, a different ritual. Well, sure. there's, it, it's, it's, it's offerings to the ancestors. That's a human thing. That's not, that's sure. not something that the Mayans did. In mm -hmm. fact, it goes back to the Olmecs. But um, so some of these things are more human than they are uh, related to the neighbors, you know. But uh, yeah, I think there was a there was a relationship there, some at some level, some level. Thank you very much. Great talk. We enjoyed it. Thanks. Well, again, thank, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I've really enjoyed going back through my notes and kind of rethinking things. I've, I've found a few nuggets in my field notes that I hadn't read for years. And so it was a delight to be able to share those with you. So it's, thank you very it's much. It's been an honor to host you. I'm very excited to see such amazing work and the I cannot emphasize how unique is this context because we know that the Taino worked in wood. We had we don't see that. Um, I saw earlier we had some of the basketry specialists like Soraya Serra was logged in earlier, and you know we just dream about seeing contexts like this. So thank you so much for sharing your um, your your experience and your knowledge. Um, I think that with that we're done. I think we're slightly over time. Um, is there any other burning question before we end the session?